My name is Ermin D. Farrell Jr. That D stands for Denny. If you know me, you call me Denny. If you call me Herman, I know you don't know me. Only my school teachers call me Herman. Outside in the neighborhood, uh, everybody calls me Denny. Uh, I was born in Harlem Hospital in 1932. I went to Jamaica, um, where my mother comes from, and um, I was there for five years until I started school when I was brought back. And I went to school at PS 46, which is now PS 28. Um, I lived at 152nd Street, then 157th Street and St. Nicholas. And I moved when the war started in 1942. Uh, my father went into the Navy I, um, my, my mother, we moved to 157th Street, 522, and I lived in that until I went into the Army in 1952, um, during the Korean War. I uh, was in the Army for two years, was accepted for officer's training school to become an officer, and the war ended. The same time I was accepted to officer's training school, and I said, why am I going to go to officer's training school when there is no war? Mm -hmm. So I didn't go, and I got out of it. I grew up in the neighborhood. Um, I lived, as I said, on 57th Street. I moved a long way. I now live on 160th Street, except I now live on Riverside Drive. I've lived there since 1969. I moved into the building. I remember it in those days, it was hard for people of our technical color to get into those buildings. But I, a friend of mine who was an assemblyman, he, um, he got me in. Okay, they're saying something. Uh, well, let's just proceed. So I, uh, my friend Steve Gottlieb, who was involved in politics, and his father was a Republican, but he knew in New York City to be a Republican was not the thing, so he became a Democrat. And I was managing a baseball team, which when I had gotten out of the Army and I was helping some kids go to play baseball, do things, and I needed a team to get uniform. And Steve said to me, we were talking, he said, well, why don't you go and s to the district leader? I said, what's a district leader? And he said, I, I said, what's a political club? I don't know. He said, well, he explained it to me. He said, you go up there, I'll take you up, because I work with him, and he'll, um, you're going to ask him for money to make buy uniforms. If you do something to name it after the club, and I said, uh, uh, I'll do that. And I went and I asked him. His name was Mr. Simonetti. Always remember that. And uh, I said to him, well, you know, we'll be... So we became the Tayoga, which is the name of our club, Pi Piutes. The Piutes were the Indian, the last Indians to revolt in America back in the 1890-something. Since then, they've been revolting still. They're getting even with us, I don't blame them. So um, uh, we got the uniforms, and, and we, we, we won awards and blah, blah, blah. Um, one, and about six months later, I, I actually went to see the, the uh, Simonetti, district leader Simonetti, in like March, just before the beginning of the baseball season. And now it's October, the, weather, the games are over, the weather is getting raw, there's this very cold, rainy uh, Saturday, and a knock on my door, and it was my friend Steve Gottlieb, and he said, Denny, uh, Mr. Simonetti needs some help, we'd like you to come out. And I said, what do you mean i got to come out? It's miserable out there. He said, well, we need to... Somebody is showing up, I forgot the name of the person, and we're going to uh, give out literature on the street. 
because some democratic hoi polloi is going to be there. I forgot who it was, but, and he, I said, so why should I do it? He said, because he helped you. And I said, oh, you're right, he helped me, I should help him back, okay. So I went to the game, I went up, it was 135th Street in Broadway. <clears throat> we went there, and when uh, I got there, Mr. Simonetti was there, and we were giving out literature, and the person came, there were speeches made, and I listened, and then when it was over, Mr. Simonetti came over to me and Steve, and he said, Steve, you know what, why don't you bring him over to the club? Yeah, we can talk. Mm -hmm. So he walked away, and Steve came, oh, that's great, that's great, he's inviting you in the club, doesn't that? And that's how I, I got into the political club I got. That was in 1965, um, or 60, sometime, I forget the exact. And that was the beginning of my going into political. And then I was in the, my parents were in the garment industry, and I was in it, I worked in it. And then my father decided he wanted to go back to Jamaica. He wanted to, he wanted to go to Jamaica to build, make clothing and put a fa factory down there, mm -hmm. which he ended up doing. And I stayed in New York. I wasn't going to Jamaica. And um, so I was looking for a job. So Steve said, well, there's a job opening working for a judge. I said, what do you mean working for a judge? Well, you, you drive in places and you, you, you'll be, you will report to the judge. You'll be a confidential aide to the judge. I said, oh, that sounds good. So I was, I went to Mr. Simonetti again, mm -hmm. and he said to me, well, you have to join the club. And, well, no, I was a member of the club, but you have to buy a ticket to the dinner of the club. You have to buy a ticket to the thing. He, he gave me about four things I would have to do, which would cost money, and that was the kickback. But it was, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't, it wasn't bad. It was going to a cocktail party and going to a dinner type of thing and for buying a page and a book we had of members in the club. So I could take a picture, and they take a picture of me and put it in the book. I still have the book now. So I agreed to do that in return. I became, I worked with Supreme Court judge. <clears throat> in the meantime, my friend Steve Gottlieb, the one who had brought me through all of this, he turned around and they, they elected him assemblyman. Mm -hmm. He was the assemblyman and he would ask me on days when he had a case in court, and I was in the courthouse because I was with, with the Supreme Court judge. He said, do me a favor, Denny, I'll go down to the court and tell the, the judge that I can't come because I'm in Albany and I'll be in next week, and then just have them or, uh, change this date because there are going to be four or five tenants there. Well, I started doing that, but then I started seeing what the problem was, and I was talking to people, so I then started talking, and the judge would say, well, what is this case all about? I said, Your Honor, these people are getting no heat, the landlord is doing this, we've got to do something about it. He said, yeah, you're right. And he'd say, well, you know what, he said to the lawyer on the other side, I'm not a lawyer, he said to the other guy, you know what, you got three weeks, because when he, they come back and Mr. Gottlieb's here, if you haven't got heat in there, I'm going to take your building away from you. I'm going to do. And after a while, I got to know what to do. I never represented anybody because you can go to jail for doing that. But you can speak on their behalf. And I would come with the people, with the tenants, and the tenants couldn't speak because they were afraid. But I would speak on their behalf. And 1973, 1974, I worked and did, I was in court all the time because people were coming to me for help and we set up an operation in the club. Mr. Simonetti had died in 1970. Mm -hmm. Steve became the district leader, so I was doing the work for the club. Then Steve decided his wife wanted to move out of the neighborhood. They were afraid in the neighborhood. 
so they moved to Westchester. So he left the legis he left as the district leader. And in 1973, I ran. Well, in 1970, I was elected as a state committee person. That's the Democratic Party state committee person for the assembly district. I got that in when Simonetti, that's the last thing he did for me. He had me, he elected me, helped me get elected as a state committee person in 1970. In 1977, they reapportioned, changed the district size, and I lost because it was a different district. I lost. But in losing, I learned something about how to win and what to do. So in 73, I found a young lady. You'll see a picture over my shoulder. The, the, you see the two people with afros on? Mm -hmm. That's me and that's her, my district leader. That was a picture from my literature in 1973 when I ran for district leader. And district leader and, and male and female. We won and I beat the person who was then the assemblyman and the district leader. So I beat him first for that. Then a year later, in September of 1920, 1974, I became the, I was elected the assembly person. I beat the person who I'd beaten the year before. I beat him twice. And then I was elected to the assembly. But I learned all of my things from my, fr my friend Steve Gottlieb because he did a lot to help people and he taught me how to do it and what to do. I lost him a couple of, uh, he, he died about two years ago much, and he was three years younger than I am mm -hmm. so that was a lot. So that's how I got into uh, So now you've... Mm -hmm. So I'm happy about that. So every thing. day in everything I do if I can do it, if I can once a week, once a month, once a year, do something that I feel good about, then, you know, when the South Africa were the bad people, they were selling, they, we had closed them down, but they were making money by selling the Kruger Rand, because it's pure gold, and they were selling it to people. I banded with the South Africa, with the banks, and I said the banks couldn't do it. Citibank, all those banks, they could not sell it. <laughs> Went after them. That's great. No, but no, I'm proud of that. There's the big catch. And I'm blocking it. Where is he? Mandela, I'm looking at the picture. Mandela gets out of prison, becomes a president. He ain't got no money. <laughs> what does he say? You gotta make them, let them sell. I got a letter asking us to let the banks sell Kugrans. <laughs> so I had to get rid of the, I had to undo the, the law and made them do it, reversed it. So. That, that, that was one I always liked as doing right and then having to undo it because mm -hmm. things change. So that, that, that's the thing. I, I, the great and the best thing I've ever done when you took <laughs> During the time I talked to you about working to help people get heat. A uh, major problem hit in 1971-2-3 when oil prices jumped from 25 and 30 cents to a dollar, a dollar and a quarter. Landlords walked away. Plus a cycle had come. All of the houses that were bought in the 30s and 40s by people who worked hard, white people usually, who worked hard, Jewish people also, and they bought these buildings. 
and they held them. And they ran up and down floors. They took, they would walk up buildings. They brought refrigerators on their backs. They did the work themselves. They were wonderful people. And they also made money and educated their children. Their children became doctors and nurses and teachers. And they died. But the house was left to the wife, to the mother, or to the son. They didn't want no damn apartments in the city. So they gave them to managers. And managing companies would run them. And when things would get really bad, one day, they're now these little old ladies suddenly became, Mrs. Sliverwitz suddenly became the person who owned the building. And they're in Florida, reti Florida retired. And they get a, get a letter saying, dear Mrs. Smith, I'm sorry to tell you, your building is in a lot of trouble. They're trying to put you in jail and we're not representing you anymore. And they dropped it. Those people were dying. I mean, they, 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 they walked away from the buildings in mass. I learned that there was always a woman, very few men, whose husband worked, who did this, who would fight for the building. And they would become the man, they would sort of like run the building. And they would find me and they'd come to me and they'd say, I want you to help us. And I'd say, all right, here's my how we do it. Uh, I want you to collect the rent, get a check, make the check payable to yourself. You go and get the money. I don't get, don't worry, give me a check that you write. Mm -hmm. But you go to the bank and you get one, and you, your name is Joe Smith, put on a Joe Smith. Then you give me that check. I can't cash it. And I know this was because guys were stealing money doing this. Give me the money and then they disappeared. So I couldn't cash it without their signature. So give me those checks. I will hold that. And when I meet with the landlords, I'm gonna tell them, See this money? This is your money. I will give it to you when you fix the leak, when you stop the coal, when you do this. Here's your money. And Your Honor, I got the money here. One year, and I, I would give the money back to it. If they had a treasurer, I would give it to the treasurer, because the treasurer couldn't steal it either because that signature was needed. And one I gave it to one lady, I'll never forget, we went in, and the landlord and the, the car shows up, and you're on it, blah, 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 blah. I say, you're on it, that place is terrible. And we have right here, and I took this envelope and I, from the lady and the treasurer, and I said, see this, we have the money. If they heat the house and you can send people, I'll give you the money, Your Honor. And he says, okay. We, I go home that night, I get a call from the treasurer. She says, Denny. I lost the check. I said, you what? She said, I lost the check. I said, the judge is going to put me in jail. Because I told him, we got the money. And he, when we show up without the damn checks, we're going to jail. I'm going to jail because I was the one that talked. Well, <clears throat> well, a couple days later, she called me back. She says, the, the, the post office man was here. I said, yeah. She said, he had the checks. I said, what? He said, somebody took the checks and put them in the mailbox. Oh my God. And every check had the person's name on it. So they couldn't do anything with it. So whoever it was, just put it in the mailbox. He charged them at that time 13 cents to buy a stamp. And he treated it as mail. He says, give me 13 cents and here's your, your, your check. So they all got, we got the check back. That was the closest I ever came to going to jail. <laughs> but, but we did a lot of that stuff. But here's what I learned. While I'm doing this, I'm burning one year, 73, I think it was 74. <coughs> I hadn't gotten to the assembly yet. It was terrible. It was a bad winter. I was getting all this. At one point, there was like 70 buildings I was running around with. And I had an idea. The landlords are all managers in these buildings. The people who own them are down in Florida. 
while my people are right in the building. What we need is managers for tenants to help them run a building. Oh, and we learn how to take away buildings. There was a rule, Article 7. Um, you can, if you do not do the service that you do, and you do certain work, the paperwork, the landlord can lose you. You can take the house away from the landlord, and you put a person in charge to run it. So I said, why don't we create a company, a neighborhood preservation company? And that company, <coughs> that company will manage the building just like the other guys, but they will work for not-for-profit buildings, for the tenants. I passed that bill in my third year in the legislature. No, yes, the third, no, no, wrong. Yes, my third year because the governor, Carey, gave me $500,000 to build my, create my own company, and then he put another million dollars out to recreate neighborhood preservation companies. Um, uh, places where it is works, 110th Street and, Col and Columbus Avenue. That whole area was beginning to fall apart. They they formed their own company there. I forgot the name of it. Ah, damn it! I used to know it. And they rebuilt that whole place mm -hmm. with those companies uh, up in um, the Bronx. Uh, I'm getting old. I'm forgetting the names of it. They, for, they formed a company, too. So that was probably the best. That company, that business still exists. Fact, factory, not business, that, that, that bill still functions. Mm -hmm. We are still putting money into it every year uh, to create people, and those companies are working everywhere. Mm -hmm. So their buildings, oh, the theory I used was, the thoughts I had was that a building may be a good place to protect you from the weather, but it's not a good place to make money. So you can afford, if you don't have to make a profit, you can run a building and it will function. So that was the theme behind it, that you could do a not-for-profit buildings and they would function. And that's why I take big pride in my neighborhood did not get a large amount of band. Now, Originally, my district was the hill, not the valley. Mm -hmm. So I, and that's where I live, I'm a hill boy, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to the valley boy. Man, used to gang battle, oh crap, <laughs> we won't talk about that. Charlie Wrangle used to have girlfriends up in the hill, he had to run home. <laughs> no, the, the, the gang of four, uh, was always the gang of four, but they were rotating depending on what they needed, you know. So. Sometimes I'd be a gang of four, and not most of the time. Again, because it was hill and valley. <laughs> Some of it I... So, one of the greatest things, of course, that this neighborhood had was, was Charlie Wrangle. Um, in that, he took the position was, if you don't mess with me, I won't mess with you, and I will support you forever. He never, no matter how bad, you had to go kill your mother for him to get, <laughs> give you up. But if you lost, then the new person he would support as much. And because of that, we did 40 years without any problems. I mean, he didn't have a primary, I didn't have a primary. When, and I worked with him, I always worked with him, so we all got along. I, I low-key myself very much, and it allows me to, this is my 42nd year, Charlie's in his 45th year, I don't know. He's 70, yeah, 45th of the year, because he came, he, won, he came in in 70. Um, I came in in 74. Um, I've always low-keyed myself, so uh, when I die, I don't think anybody will remember I was here, you know. Well, you've come to be known as the kingmaker, as I've been yeah, told. Yeah, well, that was, yeah, people have short memories. <laughs> I saw what happened to Shelley Silver uh, a couple of weeks ago, and... Uh, We've got a good guy there now, so I'm nothing against him, but mm -hmm. Shelley really got, people walked away from him, but they had to because politically anybody had supported him couldn't run for re-election mm -hmm. type of thing with the thing Shelley. So 
when you go on long ling the king, <laughs> the king is dead, long live the king. You know, that sort of thing. So you don't you don't know. But no, so the end result was that was one of the what I just talked about was one of the most important things. Uh, I, I think one of my major, major I have I have a lot of a little bit bills. I forget so many things I do. Uh, I, I, I like to do a lot of services. Um, right now at 158th Street, as I said, I grew up on between Amsterdam and Broadway. Uh, and we would go down to Riverside Drive and you had to go down these damn steep steps at this little entrance or else you had to walk over to 155th Street and go across and down or you had to walk down the ramp and then around and back if you didn't do the stairs. And there was always the brothers who wanted your glove or your... So you always had to make sure that you had a bat in your hand, you know, and you had to be careful going down the stairs because you didn't want to get guys coming up from the bottom on you and coming down on the top of you in this narrow stairs case because you'd have to use one hand to hold on so they don't throw you over and then swing the bat. So it was better to not have that happen. So you learn, you'd look around, didn't see anybody, didn't go down as fast as you <laughs> But it also meant people, women with baby carriages couldn't get down. There were beautiful parks down there. There were, and there is now. They went, the old ones got abandoned in the bad year of drugs. And then they rebuilt it a couple of years ago. And they rebuilt it after I built, I put $10 million into state money, of course, um, to put in a ramp. So then, uh, Right now, the latest and newest immigrants are the Mexicans and the Anglicans, the ones from the, the hills, and they go down there. They don't have cars yet. They haven't reached that part. The Dominicans have cars. They go to the parks at 153rd Street, but the Mexicans have to push the carriages down. And now we have a ramp back and forward. As a, 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 That's yeah, that ramp I put in that. That, and, and I just pointed out just recently this week or this month, they signed the contract to build a bridge at 153rd Street across the highway, over the railroad tracks and the highway to get people access to the park over here without having to run down some of the steepest sta stairs in the world. So you can get across it, $20 million operation but it will increase the amount of people there with the state park. Also, my appropriations, that um, how I learned when I got elected in 1974, uh, Franz Leiker, Senator Fran Leiker, who had been an assemblyman who I'd met a couple of years earlier, even though he came from further down, he came from 110th Street area, Columbia area, he came to me and he said, you got to go talk to the mayor, I mean the governor, because he gets along with you, Carrie, uh, and I want you to get a dry appropriation. I said, what the hell is a dry appropriation? That sounds obscene. He said, no, uh, it, it just puts down $129 million to build State Park, but it doesn't have any money behind it, but it keeps it in the budget. Mm -hmm and has the money in it, but doesn't have it appropriated. And we did that, and in 1982, I, um, and I kept, keep, I kept it that way. In 82, I was one of the few people who supported, now nobody remembers, but in those days, Ed Koch was going to be the big winner. And, um, and anybody who was against Koch was crazy. And I said, no, the man's not what I want. And me, Al Van, a couple other guys got together and we brought the Black Park, Park community together to support Mario. He won and one of the rewards I got besides getting uh, his first appointment was a black woman to be the head of the housing authority. And, um, and he also put in the cash for the $129 million, which we finished the plant in 1992. It took 10 years to finish the plant. 
I mean, at the, the plant, building the plant was paid for by the federal government. On top of the plant, we paid for it. And that's $129 million. And we've got one of the finest state parks right there. And I feel that was one of my big, big programs. So I, I, there are a lot of little things I've done long. Um, I, but I've survived because I, I keep low down. I, I don't go into the fields. I don't get myself shot. You know, I, mm -hmm. I work to uh, do what has to be done. And I've got a staff here that does a fabulous job taking care of women, people who have trouble. I see. Yeah, and when they come here, they, 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 we have all sorts of things that we do here. Mm -hmm. Housing we, is not as much as it used to. They changed some of the laws. A matter of fact, they're now putting a law in which I had nothing to do with in the city, which is a good idea, and that because I can't go into court anymore. Uh, I'm not allowed to, not me. Mm -hmm. no, people who are non-lawyers can't speak on behalf of tenants anymore, which killed the program. When you go, if you have a bad house housing, what you have to do is you've got to organize the people, don't pay the money, do the checks as I say, then you negotiate and you give them the money as they do the work. Mm -hmm. But you have to go and talk to the judge to let him know this. And because the tenant, the landlord will want you to show up every week, he have pulled you in. You can't work, make a living, and go there. So three or four people would show up and I would show up. And I'd speak, I wouldn't represent them, I'd speak on behalf of them. And they wouldn't be there unless there was a reason for them to be there. They changed a judge, a friend of mine, I put him in the office, but he didn't realize what he did. Passed a law and it said, you have to show up every day. No one can speak on anybody else's behalf. That means all the landlords have to do is to keep calling you back, calling you back. You can't do a rent strike anymore because you lose your job. So they silenced us, and I can't go up and say anything because I'm not allowed to talk for, for anybody. I can only talk for myself. That, that burned me, that burned me. I'd stop doing it, but you'll see a little guy out front, Abbott Ruskin, he's been with me from when we created the Neighborhood Preservation. He ran one, he was, worked in one of my companies when we had it, when we ran one of the companies. But our neighborhood churned around, so we didn't need it anymore. But I mean, it just... So now the city council is passing a bill where there will be lawyers available for tenants so they don't go in before. I don't know if it's going to get... They said there's some coverage now, so that people are covered. So that, that's something that will, that, that, that's working, that's, that it's good. But, I, but everything else, the concept is not good. But also because things have changed, landlords now are trying to run you out of the house. In the old, they weren't trying, they just wanted their money. Now, and they weren't, they didn't now, they want to get rid of you so they can raise the rent and deregulate. That's what they're going for. And if they deregulate, then they can get $2,000, $3,000 for the apartment. So there's a lot of things going on there. But you can't go into court with them. But we can talk in people's help. So we have our, all our people can pick up a case and help a tenant who's having trouble writing letters under my name and other things like that. So we do a lot of that. And then we get welfare. The welfare problems are not as bad as they used to be uh, because there are better things. There are taxes. People have tax problems. There are senior citizens who live in the building above us who have tax re returns they're entitled to based on being a co-operator. Uh, and so because of them, we help them. I have one of my people that do, does that all the time. And I got this ugly white guy and he scares people. That's his job. <laughs> <laughs>